Good evening and many thanks for watching KTN News. My name is Dennis Aseto. Welcome to this edition of Planet Action, your number one premier show on matters to do with climate change. What we must do to be able to make sure that we save this place we call home. And with that, we go straight to some of the stories and what is being done to make sure that we change this tide. Now, climate change continues to be a conversation piece, not only in Kenya, but the whole world. Several initiatives have been put in place to deal with the issue that continues to wreak havoc across the world. Initiatives like tree planting and growing, adaptation and mitigation, a fund for loss and damage, and many other initiatives have been proposed to help address this. But even as these initiatives are being discussed, what are we doing on a personal level? Now, Peter Mardens is the Belgian ambassador to Kenya, and here, yeah, it is a story towards getting it right. As the world talks about fighting climate change, a lot needs to be done. Food security is a sure way of addressing this, but on a personal level, we can all play our part by embracing change. The garden behind me is a, is a, is a vertical vegetable garden that's part of a, a larger project that we're implementing at this point. Maybe I want to go back and tell the story from the very beginning, right? So. I'm a baby boomer. I was born in 1960. I drive cars. I fly planes. I eat meat. And I have millennial sons. And those millennial sons, when they were teenagers, they were going through that whole story that teenagers go through knowing everything better than their parents. We've all done that, right? We've all been through that exact same issue with, with our, our kids knowing it better. And most of the time, you know, while they, when they grow up, they figure out that, oh, you know what, dad may not have been all that wrong. But these kids, this generation, the millennials, on one thing were absolutely spot on. It was climate change, it was sustainability, it was, it was the fact that we're doing stuff to this planet that will not allow us to survive as humanity. As the conversation continues to gather momentum, there are others who have gone far and wide to try address this existing problem. In Kenya, there are those who have managed to leave a mark on the fight against climate change. About a decade ago, I was starting to think about it. So we arrive here in Nairobi, the green city in the sun. Um, and a couple of months later, we're doing a, we're, we're planning a, um, uh, a team building exercise. And we end up going to the Mara. There's a marathon there for, for the elephant projects. Um, and there's a couple, of, a couple of Belgians, a guy called Loic and his wife is called Valerie, who have this most amazing project going on there. They're turning the safari camp that they bought carbon neutral, net zero. And they invited us to come and stay with the whole team. So 40 of us descended on that camp one, one weekend in December of 2021. And at the end of your stay, what Loic usually does is he shows you around his camp. And he shows you how he's achieved carbon neutrality or net, net, net zero-ness. Is that a word? OK. Um, and he shows you his solar panels and his battery park and his biodigester and his water capture and recycling and his vegetable gardens like this one, like the vertical one. And I was just thinking to myself, wait a minute, this guy has the same infrastructure as I do. He's got 10 tents, he's got 40 people working for him, he's got three acres of land, he's got a couple of cars. Me and my embassy, I have, I have two buildings, I have two cars, I have 20 staff, I have four acres of land or five acres of land. That's the same infrastructure. We're not in the same business, obviously not. I mean, he's, he's a safari operator, a safari camp operator. Me, I'm an embassy. God knows that those are two different things. But the infrastructure is exactly the same. So I said to him, do you think we can copy this? And he said, let me come and take a look. So he came and took a look. And he said, absolutely. You have enough roof space to, to, uh, to install the solar panels that will allow you to have to be completely dependent or to be completely independent from the from the grid you have enough space to do your water capture and your water recycling you also have enough space to do your vertical gardens and installing a biogas a biodigester for for gas for the for cooking is easy so i said okay let's do it a journey that has taken him three months has seen him be self-sufficient producing his own power food and cooking energy Last October, we started constructing. We started the retrofit. And we're almost there. We're a couple of weeks away. I think we'll be inaugurating this sometime in April. But yeah, we have the two roofs, the house, the residence, and then the office, which is down at the bottom of the garden. The roofs are full of solar panels. They're connected to batteries. 
which are going to make us independent from the grid. The grid is going to be our backup. You know, in houses like these, usually you have a generator as a backup, which is terrible because it's diesel and it's smelly and it's loud and it's whatever bad you can think about it. It's terrible. Our backup is going to be KPLC, who, by the way, gets its power from the Kenya grid, which is already more than 90 percent sustainable. So, you know, we're adding to the sustainability of the whole system here. So that's the, the solar panels and the batteries. And then we have the biodigester where we, we cook with. You know, an embassy residence, we, you know, we, we do stuff. We, we have lots of functions and parties and, and people coming over. And the cooking gets done on biogas. And the biogas comes from the vegetables that we, from the kitchen scraps, and also from a local grocer who's giving us his non, unsold produce. So, you know, and by the way, the unsold produce is already halfway through the biodigester because it's already starting to rot, which is a cool thing. We have a thousand square meters of roof catching rainwater. And all that rainwater goes into places, lagoons like this one, you'll see it in a minute. That, and that water gets recycled and turned into irrigation water for the vegetable garden and for the gardens themselves. So yeah, we're, we're going all the way. We all, by the way, we also bought an electric car. I almost forgot to say that, which of course we're gonna charge on our own systems, which are solar. Food security is an important subject when we talk about climate change. Every government's headache is being able to feed its citizens, especially at a time when we experience extreme weather patterns, but we sure can do something about this. All these, all the vegetables that you see there, they all get drip irrigated. Two times, four minutes a day of drip irrigation is all the water it needs. And oh, by the way, they're not, the, the, the plants aren't growing in, in, in soil. They're growing in volcanic ash, in pumice. So the water filters through and can get recycled. So the two times, three minutes a day, all that water comes back. So it's, you know, there, we have a herb garden up by the, near the kitchen. That has a 50 liter tank. That's all. For all the herbs that I use in my kitchen, I have one 50-liter tank. So drought, bring it. Fight against climate change cannot be held if there is no recycling being done. Recycling of waste matter, water and others is just one way of making sure that we use and reuse what we already have. The interesting thing about recycled wastewater is that it has organic matter in it. Even after, you know, as much filtration as you can get, it has some organic matter in it. And that organic matter, what's that? It helps grow, it's, you know, it helps grow the plants. So we use that waste, the recycled wastewater to grow the plant. Achieving net zero is a combination of many things, recycling, embracing technology, and going electric mobility. In a country that enjoys sun throughout the year, it's paramount that we try to embrace solar energy to be able to lower our individual carbon print. KPLC is going to be my backup. I've installed enough battery power to, to, to be able to function just on, on the batteries alone. And the batteries get, get charged by the sun or by the solar panels. And at night, KPLC keeps charging the batteries. So my batteries are always going to be at 100% in the morning. Um, and, and, and in other words, it'll be a minimal amount of, of, uh, of, of, um, of usage from KPLC that I'll be using because most of it will be my own power that I'm using. The more people go off grid, the more stable your network is going to be. You know, everybody keeps telling me every time the power goes out, it's because the, the distribution is, 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 uh, is fragile. Well, take more people off grid. You, increase the, you, you decrease the fragility of the network. So that's the kind of debates we're, we're, we're having right now. But why should everyone join in on this journey? Is it worth it embracing solar energy? Largely for cost reasons. Uh, and also because of, like I said, consciousness. You know, my, my millennial sons made us believe that, that, it, that, it's, that it's worth doing for, for, the, for the sake of humanity. And that you have to do it at an individual level and that you have to do what you can at the level of the individual. You can always sit back and say, you know, let the government take care of everything. That's the easy way. Absolutely, that's the easy way out. But if you don't do it as an individual, you're not going to move forward. The United Nations Environmental Assembly will be held in Kenya, in Nairobi, in the next few weeks. And with it, a lot will be discussed among them, the Green Deal. Implementing the Green Deal, implementing the agreements we have with countries like Kenya on, on environmental issues. There was something very interesting happened. We, as, as we usually do, we, we prepare this presidency months or years ahead of time. And we then write up a program. 
And one of the things, one of the very interesting things that happened in writing up that program was that all my colleagues, when they were looking at the Africa chapter of our presidency program, this was around about the time that President Ruto was making his statements at the Africa Climate Summit and then in the UN, in the UN in, in September. And they took inspiration from President Ruto's statements about how the, 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 we in the North and, 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 and our partners here, in, especially on the African continent, can work together on these issues and should work together on these issues while learning the lessons from the past but not obsessing about them and, moving and, and deciding both of us to move forward. As the conversations around net zero and other forms of climate change initiatives need to be in place, we must all play our part. We must be the change makers and play our part in this conversation. What we did today will definitely determine the future of the next generation. For KTN News, I'm Dennis Aseto. And very well, what we do today will determine the future of the next generation. That is the words of Ambassador Martins, the Belgian ambassador to Kenya. And in studio with me right now is Clive Donnelly. He is a climate ambassador, climate activist, as we have this discussion. And uh, Karibu Sana and Happy New Year to you. Thank you uh, so you're just much. looking Thank fresh you. from COP, but that conversation, we're going to have it a bit later. But based on uh, that story that we've just um, watched right now, what's your take on our individual initiatives in making sure that we go net zero? Yeah, actually, in the world that we're living today, I think uh, there's so many tangible solutions that we can incorporate in our daily lifestyles. Because I believe that when we bring in our innovative thinking supported by you know, vast technology and expertise, we can bring in a tangible solution in mitigating, you know, climate crisis. The fact that in many, many African homes, you know, those food uh, uh, remains are not being recycled. We need to embrace a circular economy in our, in our, even in our, in our own homes, just like the way the ambassador is doing. Uh, that, that, that is a, is a really uh, critical circular economy system within your own uh, within your own system and you know it casts it it reduces a lot of uh, you know monetary spending and also uh, it also brings in more innovative ideas innovative solutions also for biodiversity to thrive in within your own setting mm -hmm. and uh, we've also seen that the the, the, the ambassador is talking in terms of uh, us being able to embrace technology and with technology comes uh, the biodigesters that yeah. he has uh, now here is a question of solar panel and you know these are some of the discussions that will be coming to to the country when uh, UNEA, united nations environmental assembly gets here he even alluded to that and now in terms of just having this discussion and making sure that we take advantage of the sun that we enjoy almost 365 days in a year um, how important is that discussion moving into trying to be sustainable moving forward yeah, yeah, it is critical that, you know, Africa as a continent, we have abundant resources towards, you know, realizing that we are transitioning to clean renewables energy. Mm -hmm. The grid systems, the innovative idea and solution is still there. But again, it is up to our local governments to scale up, you know, the financing uh, for this uh, technological advancement. But again, it is also pivotal for people to put in ambitious efforts towards realizing that we are bridging in the energy deficit gap in our local communities and even in our, in our own homes, we can buy the solar systems. We can ensure that when we are not using electricity, we can switch it off to, you know, uh, to, to avoid wastage when water is not uh, being used, uh, you can turn it off. But again, on the bigger picture, there is also need to realize that, you know, tech, with technological advancement comes again with a lot of benefits and a lot of challenges. For instance, in Africa, we have at least 40, 40 to 60 percent of uh, minerals that are needed to power the global transition to uh, clean energy. We are talking about uh, minerals like cobalt, lithium, which is really critical in the transition process. And therefore, uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, these minerals in DRC. Mm. But again, we've seen there's a lot of violation of human rights whereby children and wa are working in these mineral uh, mining zones. And so therefore, in this uh, gaining these critical minerals, uh, which is also pivotal to ensure that you know, human rights, right-based solutions are advanced for the local communities if we want to thrive together. The issue of capitalism is still detrimental to our continent uh, towards advancing, and we've seen what is happening 
within the DRC. But again, on the positive side, already we have technological advancement solutions, and we are happy that you know Kenya is one of the countries that you know it is scaling its um, uh, clean energy uh, uh, revolution close to 95 percent. We are advancing. We are almost reaching the mark. But again, there is a lot that needs to be done, and therefore. Uh, I believe that when you bring in the innovative thinking and uh, critical capacity building uh, brought in by the government and also the critical funding to bridge in the energy deficit gap, we are at a roadmap towards embracing at zero. And I see now, even with, when you talk in terms of sustainability, uh, embracing technology, we've seen the vertical gardens uh, yeah. that, that, that we've just showcased in that story. And uh, one thing that stood out is the fact that he is only using 50 liters of uh, 50 liters of water to irrigate his farm eight minutes a day for uh, for four minutes in the morning four minutes in in the afternoon and he yeah. says he's able to do that and serve his entire community at, at the embassy therefore moving forward in terms of also going smart agriculture that's what he's pretty much talking about yeah. How critical is that in terms of Africa embracing that to be able to just be food secure? Because with, uh, we, 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 with, uh, with extreme weather shocks that we continue to face, floods sweeping away uh, our crops and uh, too much sun drought burning away crops. Smart agriculture, yeah. food sustainability, how critical is that? Yeah, yeah, actually this is very critical to be embraced because statistics shows that, you know, there are so many countries that are now uh, moving towards desert foods. Mm -hmm. Desert foods, when I say these are you know, communities that have access to food that are not fresh, so they opt to go for you know, fast food, like you know, the junk mm -hmm. foods, if I may put it that way. But again, it is very critical that you know, with devastating cycles of uh, climate crisis, uh, changed weather patterns, it's, it's having a detrimental impact in food security, the water scarcity. And therefore, we as humans, we need to come up with innovative solutions and ideas that can help us uh, to, to, you know, reduce hunger uh, to, and also to scale the, the, the 2030 uh, SDGs agenda. And therefore, the vertical farming is uh, really critical. And in schools, we've also seen very many initiatives coming up, children being helped to put kitchen gardens. And kitchen garden is also something that is very easier to set uh, in your local home. Uh, for, for people who are having you know, bigger or minimal spaces, it is very uh, easy to set, provided you have you know, those bags, you, ha you know how uh, to irrigate water, and also uh, gaining a few uh, experience or, or knowledge on how to, you know, what crop to plant within your garden. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's a, the issue of pesticide is one, uh, one of the uh, biggest challenge that you're facing. And even there is a, one of the resolutions on the UNEA, mm -hmm. uh, draft resolutions will be addressing the issue of pesticides. You see that there's a lot of pesticide being spread on foods. And these pesticides, pesticide, they're also detrimental to biodiversity and also affecting the food system. But now, you know, when you have a kitchen garden or a vertical farming within your own setting, you have access to foods, uh, food that is fresh. And the bigger part of it, again, it also uh, plays a critical role in, in terms of, of setting, reducing your, your, your personal carbon mm -hmm. footprints. Uh, when I say carbon foot, uh, personal footprints, it means that, you know, let's say uh, food is being transported or uh, cabbages or carrots are being transported from a market like Gikomba, maybe mm -hmm. to local communities like uh, maybe in Kayole. You know, the, the vehicle itself is going to pollute a lot of uh, carbon. But now when you have access in your own home, you're cutting across, you're cutting out these uh, emissions that you would have gone through this process. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is critical to have, to come up with the consolidated ideas, but again, which really adds up to, you know, a lot of innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, with all these conversations now, we had the Africa Climate Summit, we discussed these uh, before COP. Yeah. But now here's a question where the Africa Climate Summit, the leaders came to Kenya, Nairobi Declaration was in place. And that formed the basis upon which Africa was going to COP28 yeah. to have discussions around what is ailing Africa, how Africa wants issues to do with climate change should be addressed. You were at COP. Did that document make any difference? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, negotiations, it, also, it, it is always quite uh, 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 
technical mm -hmm. because when it comes to negotiations as Africa, 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 we negotiate under the African group. Okay. Uh, now that's how we, we push mm -hmm. our, our position as an, as an African country, uh, Africa continent. as a continent. Mm -hmm. But again, um, the declaration that uh, came out during the African Climate Summit, it formed, it formed a very critical basis for we African countries beginning to have our own conversations and mm -hmm. ideas. And this, this document, it, also, it was also filtered into some of the outcomes. But again, the African position didn't come out clearly because uh, uh, based on scientific evidence, uh, and African position, we need to cut out emissions at the source. But you see, most of the times we find that these negotiations, they are turned, turned down, uh, they are watered down. The African position sometimes failed, fails to come out uh, uh, clearly in these negotiations. Mm -hmm. For African position in, on climate negotiations, we need to, I believe we need to, uh, to form a basis calling for, you know, uh, efforts on how we can tackle, you know, water scarcity, how we can boost uh, uh, resilience in terms of our uh, food production, mm -hmm. how we can ensure that, you know, we are minimizing the desertification that is really creeping in in Africa. And the fact that our emissions is neg negligible, I think that, you know, African position on, on climate change, it should, it should really form a stronger basis and also putting uh, global north into account. But again, we people from Africa or Africa as a continent, we also need, need to continue leading the path towards ensuring that, you know, we are uh, transitioning towards net zero and no one is being left behind. Now, when uh, during the Paris Accord, we were talking about $100 billion that are supposed to get to Africa, but by the time we're going to COP28, yeah. we we're only talking about 10%, that is around $10 billion. Yeah. And now here we have um, COP28 that comes forth and talks about a loss and damage fund that was discussed during the COP27. Yeah. We remember how that was also a big matter. It took people three days to just agree on, on that fact. But now here is a question where we have now the 720 something million dollars that have been promised towards loss and damage. Mm -hmm. Do we have policies on how that money will get, say, to Kenya? and how that, those same funds will trickle down to the grassroots? Yeah, uh, first of all, the money that was channeled, uh, the loss and damage finance, it is actually after 28 years of climate negotiations mm -hmm. is when we are getting money that is actually really, really little, mm -hmm. yet communities in Africa and, in, and also glo entire global south have been facing detrimental impacts of climate change, adverse weather patterns, but this fund was really, it came at a critical point, but it was really little. When it comes to policies, again, there is no clear mechanism on how other countries are going to continue to contribute to this critical fund that is needed as a matter of urgency. And also, again, when it comes to issues of integrity within our own systems, we are not sure on how the issue of integrity are going to be tackled for this fund to reach out to uh, local communities suffering adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, another thing on this critical fund, I believe that there's need to, to have a clear mechanism in shaping out how we can balance, you know, the the, the deficits and also realizing that communities communities are becoming are building their own resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you check on um, uh, on the prospects of the loss and damage fund, you find that the fund that was channeled was quite um, not impressive. For instance, a country like United States of America which has been on the line as one of the biggest polluters. And the fund that they channeled was really quite abusive for our continent. Because I believe if we are to tackle climate crisis, we need to have a, a clear roadmap on how we can transition together and working out in solidarity. But this is not how the solidarity looks like. Mm -hmm. This is only the one side, the blinded side of the climate equation. But Africa as a country that has been affected adversely by climate crisis is always being left behind, but still it remains attractive to the eyes of many you know, countries or many people uh, are, who are some of them are capitalists. But again, we need to come up with our own ideas and our own solution on how we can scale, out, uh, scale up the loss and damage finance. And now when we talk about loss and damage, there's pretty much uh, emissions that have, uh, uh, have been emitted over years now. Yeah. And uh, now Africa, we say, uh, contains one of the solutions because we have the minerals that we need for us to even be able to transit to green energy. Yeah. But we are only left with massive holes here after 
mining has done in these things gone. So and therefore mm -hmm. as, 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 as the continent, as the global uh, populace sit down to have these discussions, where are we in terms of making sure that while we have the minerals, investments come to Africa, investments go to say Congo, and uh, that these batteries are produced here so that we are able to capacity build the people who are here and uh, be able to also give back because being left with the whole is not the solution. Therefore, how do we have this discussion such that it is not only about us offering but us also being empowered to be able to be solution givers to the world? Yeah, I think uh, on this particular question, uh, we can begin by, you know, incorporating the environmental governance prospects mm -hmm. and also through the environmental governance, trying also to make communities realize how, you know, this is really critical and how we can trans transition because you find that there's a lot of uh, mining that has been going on. Uh, within the African countries, but again, you find that the countries themselves, they do not benefit. benefit yeah. For instance, France has been getting a lot of um, uh, minerals to power the uh, uranium to power its coal plants. But again, you find that countries that have been, uh, countries that have been producing this critical mineral, they still live below poverty level. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the key issues that, you know, at cross-cutting issue that's, that needs to be addressed. Another issue, uh, incorporating the environmental governance prospects and also ensuring the multilateral environmental agreements are being factored in into the local grassroots initiative dialogues. Mm -hmm. Because if this, they cannot be factored within the grassroots dialogues, so then we are making um, the, the, pro, the negotiations or decisions are not tangible or are not uh, inclusive, I mean. Uh, the, the reason why I'm saying this is because we've seen a lot of uh, capitalistic mining, if I may put it that way, or acqu acquiring resources within uh, African countries, but again, they do not really benefit uh, from it. Another thing I believe is if we, can have, if we can come up with a critical knowledge on how we can boost the uh, grassroots initiatives, we can have frequent capacity building, and also if the government can put in more local efforts uh, for, for, for communities to learn, uh, telling more, uh, encouraging more uh, innovative solutions, pushing more policies that, you know, are, are resonate with local communities, I think it can be really uh, mm -hmm. critical. Mm -hmm. That is Clive Donnelly, the brains, I tell you, on issues to do with climate change, what we need to do, capacity build across borders.